chapter 118, a simple thing. About an hour later, we were all seated in the giant auditorium waiting for Mr. Tushman to give his middle school address. The auditorium was even bigger than I imagined it would be, bigger even than the one at the other school. I looked around and there must have been a million people in the audience. Okay, maybe not a million, but definitely a lot. Thank you, Headmaster Jansen, for those very kind words of introduction, said Mr. Tushman, standing behind the podium on the stage as he talked into the microphone. Welcome, my fellow teachers and members of the faculty. Welcome, parents and grandparents, friends and honored guests, and most especially, welcome to my fifth and sixth grade students. Welcome to the Beecher Prep Middle School graduation ceremonies. Everyone applaud. Every year, continued Mr. Tushman, reading from his notes with his reading glasses way down on the tip of his nose, I am charged with writing two commencement addresses, one for the fifth and sixth grade graduation ceremony today, and one for the seventh and eighth grade ceremony that will take place tomorrow. And every year I say to myself, let me cut down on my work and write just one address that I can use for both situations. Seems like it shouldn't be such a hard thing to do, right? And yet each year I still end up with two different speeches, no matter what my intentions. And I finally figured out why this year, no, as you might assume, simply because tomorrow I'll be talking to an older crowd with a middle school experience that is largely behind them, whereas your middle school experience is largely in front of you. Now, I think it has to do more with this particular age that you are right now, this particular moment that in your lives that even after 20 years of my being around students this age still moves me because you're the cups kids you're at the edge between childhood and everything that comes after you're in transition we're all gathered here together mr touchman continued taking off his glasses and using them to point at all of us in the audience all your families friends and teachers to celebrate not only your achievement of this past year, meet your middle schoolers, but your endless possibilities. When you reflect on this past year, I want you all to look at where you are now and where you've been. You've all gotten a little taller, a little stronger, a little smarter, I hope. There's some people in the audience chuckle. But the best way to measure how much you've grown isn't by inches or the number of laps you can now run on the track or even your great point average, though those things are important to be sure. It's what you've done with your time, how you've chosen to spend your days and whom you have touched this, this year. That to me is the greatest measure of success. There's a wonderful line in the book by J.M. Berry. And no, it's not Peter Pan. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to clap if you believe in fairies. Everyone here, everyone laughed again. But in another book by J.M. Barry called The Little White Bird, he writes, he starts flipping through a small book on the, on the podium until he found the page he was looking for. And then he put on his reading glasses. Shall we make a new route of life? Always try to be a little kinder than it is necessary. Here, Mr. Tushman looked up in the audience, at the audience. Kinder than is necessary, he repeated. What a marvelous line, isn't it? Kinder than is necessary, because it's not enough to be kind. One should be kinder than needed. Why I love that line, that concept, is that it reminds me that we can carry with us, as human beings, not just the cap capacity to be kind, but the very choice of kindness. And what does that mean? How is that measured? You can't use a yardstick. It's like I was saying just before, it's not like measuring how much you've grown in a year. It's not exactly quantifiable, is it? How do we know we've been kind? What is being kind in a way? Put on his reading glasses again and started flipping through another small book. Here's another passage in a different book I 
I'd like to share with you, he said. If you'll bear with me for a while, I'll find it. Ah, here we go. In Under the Eye of a Clock by Christopher Nolan, the main character is a young man who is facing some extraordinary challenges. There's one, this one part where someone helps him. A kid in his class, on the surface is a small gesture, but to this young man whose name is Joseph is, well, if you, if you will permit me, he cleared his throat and read from the book. It was at moments such as these that Joseph recognized the face of God in human form. It glimmered in their kindness to him. It glowed in their keenness. It hinted in their caring. Indeed, it caresses in their gaze. He paused and took off his reading glasses again. It glimmered in their kindness to him. He repeated, smiling. Such a simple thing, kindness, such a simple thing. A nice word of encouragement given when needed, an act of friendship, a passing smile. He closed the book, put it down, and leaned forward on the podium. Children, what I want to impart to you today is an understanding of the value of that simple thing called kindness. And that's all I want to leave you with today. I know I'm kind of infamous for my um, verbosity, everyone. Here everyone laughed again. I guess he knew he was known for his long speeches. But what I want you, the students, to take away from your middle school experience, he continued, is the sure knowledge that in the future you make for yourself, anything is possible. If every single person in this room made it a rule that wherever you are, whenever you can, you will try to act a little kinder than it is necessary, the world really would be a better place. And if you do this, if you act just a little kinder than is necessary, someone else, somewhere, someday, may recognize in you, in every single one of you, the face of God. He paused and shrugged. Or oh, whatever politically correct spiritual representations of universal goddess you happen to believe in, he added quickly, smiling, which got a lot of laughs and loads of applause, especially from the back of Odo auditorium where the parents were sitting. Chapter 119 or worse. I like made a touchman speech but I have to admit I kind of zone out a little during some of the other speeches. I tune in again as Miss Rubin started reading off the names of the kids who made the high honor roll because we were supposed to stand up when our names were called. So I waited and listened for my name as we went down the list alphabetically. Red Kingsley, Maya Markovitz, August Pumin. I stood up. And when we she finished reading off the names, she asked us all to face the audience and take a bow, and everyone applauded. I had no idea where in that huge crowd my parents might be sitting. All I could see were the flashes of light from people taking photos and parents waving at their kids. I pictured mom waving at me from somewhere even though I couldn't see her. Then Mr. Tushman came back to the podium to read it present the medals for the academic excellence, and Jack was right. Simena Chin won the gold medal for overall academic excellence in the fifth grade, Charlotte won the silver. Charlotte also won a gold medal for music, Amos won the medal for overall excellence in sports, which I was really happy about because ever since the natural retreat, I recon I consider Amos to be like one of my best friends in school, but I was really, really thrilled when Mr. Touchman called out Summer name for the gold medal in creative writing. I saw Summer put her hand over her mouth when her name was called, and when she walked up onto the stage, I yelled, Woohoo, Summer, as loudly as I could, though I don't think she heard me. Over after the last name were called, all the kids who just won a was suit next to each other on stage, and Mr. Trisman said to the audience, Ladies and gentlemen, I am very honored to present to you this year Beecher Prep School Scholastic Achievers. Congratulations to all of you. I applauded as the kids on stage bow. I was so happy for summer. 
The final awards this morning, said Mr. Tushman, after the kids on Tate had returned to their seat, is the handy word picture mirror to honor students who have been notable or extemporary in certain areas throughout the school year. Typically, this matter has been a way of acknowledging volunteerism or service to the school. I immediately figured how long would get this matter because he organized the code drive this year. So I kept zone out a bit again. I looked at my watch. 10.56. I was getting hungry for lunch already. Henry Ward Beecher was, of course, the 19th century abolitionist and fiery humanizer for human rights, after whom this school was named. Mr. Tushman was saying when I started paying attention again. While reading up on his life in preparation for this award, I came upon a page that he wrote that seemed particularly consistent with the themes I touched on earlier. Teams that have been running, ruminating upon all year long. Not just the nature of kindness, but the nature of one's kindness, the power of one's principle, the test of one's character, the strength of one's courage. And here the weird things happen. Mr. Touchman's voice cracked a bit, like he got all choked up. He actually cleared his throat and took a big sip of water. I started paying attention for real now to what he was saying. The strength of one courage, he repeated quietly, nodding and smiling. He held up his right hand like he was counting up. Courage, kindness, friendship, character. These are the qualities that define us as human beings and propel us an occasion to greatness. And this is what the Henry Ward Beecher Medal is about, recognizing greatness. But how, we, how do we do that? How do we measure something like witness? Again, then, there's no drastic for that kind of thing. How do we even define it? Well, Bicho actually had an answer for that. He put his reading glasses on again, lifted leaf through a book, and started to read. Witness, wrote Bicho, lies not in being strong, but in the right using of strength. He is the ready whose strength carry up the most hurt. And again, out of the blue, he got all choked up. He put his two index finger over his mouth for a second before continuing. He is the ready, he finally continued, whose strength carry up the most hurt by the attraction of his own. Without further ado, this year I'm very proud to award the Henry Ward Beecher Merrill to the student whose quiet strength had carried up the most hurt. So will August Pullman please come up here to receive this award? Chapter 120 Floating People started applauding before Mr. Touchman's words actually registered in my brain. I heard Major who was next to me, gave a little happy scream when she heard my name, and Mice, who was on the other side of me, pat my back. Stand up, get up, said kiss all around me, and I felt lots of hands pushing me upward out of my seat, guiding me to the edge of the road, patting my back, high-fiving me, way to go, Orky, nice going, Orky. I even started hearing my name being chanted, Orky, Orky. Or gee. I looked back and saw Jack leading the chance, first in the air, smiling and signaling for me to keep going, and almost shouting through his hands, Hoo hoo, little dude. Then I saw Summer smiling as I walked past her row, and when she saw me look at her, she gave me a secret little thumbs up and mouthed the silent cool beans to me. I laughed and shook my hand like I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. I think I was smiling. Maybe I was beaming, I don't know. As I walked up the aisles toward the stage, all I saw was the blue of happy bright faces look at me and hands clapping for me. And I heard people yelling things out at me. You deserve it, Orgy. Good for you, Orgy. I saw all my teachers in the aisles, Mr. Brown and Miss Pesodas and Mr. Roaches and Mrs. Anatapi and Nurse Molly and all the others, and they were cheering for me, hoo-hooing and whistling. I felt like it was floating. It was so weird. 
like the sun was shining full force on my face and the wind was blowing. As I got closer to the stage, I saw Miss Rubin waving, me, waving at me in the front row, and then next to her was Mrs. G, who was crying hysterically, a happy crying, smiling and clapping me the whole time. And as I walked up the steps to the stage, the most amazing thing happened. Everyone started standing up, not just the front rows, but the whole audience suddenly got up on their feet, whooping, hollering, clapping like crazy. It was a standing ovation for me. I walked across the stage to, to Mr. Rattachman, who shook my hand with both his hands and whispered in my ear, Well done, Orgy. Then he placed the gold medal over my head, just like they do in the Olympics, and had me turn to face the audience. It felt like I was watching my feel myself in a movie, almost, like I was someone else. It was like that last scene in Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope, when Luke Skywalker, Walker, Han Solo, and Chewbacca are being a plot for destroying the Death Star. I could almost hear the Star Wars theme music playing in my head as I stood on the stage. I wasn't even sure why I was getting this medal really. No, that's not true. I knew why. It's like people you see sometimes, and you can't imagine what it would be like to be that person. Whether it's somebody in the wheelchair or somebody who can't talk. Only I know that I'm the person to other people. Maybe to every single person in that whole auditorium. To me though, I'm just me, an ordinary kid. Chapter 121, yeah. Pictures Afterwards, you watch the shopping from the fifth and sixth grade cell under the human right hand in the back of the school. All the kids found their parents and I didn't mind at all. And mom and dad hugged me like crazy or went by a wrapper on around me and spun me left and right about 20 times. And Papa and Tata hugged me, and Aunt Kat and Uncle Paul and Uncle Ben. Everyone had teary eyes and wet cheeks, but my uncle was funniest. He was crying more than anyone and squeezed me so tight that her fire was had to practically pry her off of me, which made them both laugh. Everyone started taking pictures of me and pulling out their flip, and then Dad got me, Summer, and Jack. Together for a workshop, we put our arms around each other's shoulder for the first time I can remember. I wasn't even thinking about my face. I was just smiling a bit fast mine for all the different cameras clicking away from me at me. Flash fast grip lick smiling away as Jack's parents, Summer's mom, started breaking. Then Red and Maya come came over, flash flash and then Charles came over and asked if she could take a picture with us and we were not sure, of course and then Charles' parents were shopping away at our little group along with everyone else's parents and the next thing I knew, the two masses came over and Henry and Miles and Spanner and Amos came over and Simena and we were all in this big Thai hotel at parent drinking away like we were on a red carpet somewhere and Lucas, Isa, Nano, Abel, Shiston, Amy and lost track of who else came over and one technically all I knew for sure is that we were all loved and squeezing in tight against each other and no one seemed to care if it was my face that was next to theirs or not in fact, I don't mean to brag here but it kind of felt like everyone wanted to get close to me Chapter 122 The Walk Home We walked to our house for cake and ice cream after the reception Jack and his parents and his little brother Jamie Summer and her mother, Uncle Paul and Aunt Kate, Uncle Ben, Tara and Popa, Justine and Via and Miranda, Mom and Dad, 
It was one of those great June days when the sky is completely blue and the sun is shining, but it isn't so hot that you wish you were on the beach instead. It was just the perfect day. Everyone was happy. I still felt like I was floating. The Star Wars hero music, music in my head. I walked with Summer and Jack, and we just couldn't stop cracking up. Everything made a laugh. We were in that giggly kind of mood when all someone has to do is look at you and you start laughing. I heard Dad's voice up ahead and look up. He was telling everyone a funny story I, as I walked down the Amesfort Avenue. The grown-ups were, were all laughing too. It was like Mom always said, Dad could be a comedian. I noticed Mom wasn't walking with a group of grown-ups, so I looked behind me. She was she was hanging back a bit, smiling to herself like she was thinking of something sweet. She seemed happy. I took a few steps back and surprised her by hugging her as she walked. She put her arm around me and gave me a squeeze. Thank you for making me go to school, I said quietly. She hugged me she hugged me close and leaned down and kissed me and kissed the top of my head. Thank you, Augie, she answered softly. For what? For everything you've given us, she said, for coming into our lips, for begging you, for being you. She bent down and whispered in my ear, You really are a wonder, Aki. You are a wonder.